With reports that 2019 calculations are informing organized legislative obstruction on key budgetary and project funding instruments, the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan implementation is being closely scrutinized. Since the time of Adam Smith, there have been thousands of publications on the issue, and theories of development are legion. However, whatever their differences, development economists agree that for a country to prosper, there must be an increase in the level of national output. That is it. There must be an increase in the level of national output. And this explains why we considered our Made in Nigeria focus as critical to our turnaround. And the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, therefore, includes that concept, that inward concept, Made in Nigeria, looking at what we can produce, turning the country from principally a consuming to a producing nation. However, the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan is more than this. It sets out in a single document a comprehensive strategy for increasing our national productivity and output in order to achieve our objective of a prosperous economy providing maximum welfare for all our citizens. Our aim, simply put, is to achieve a growth rate of 7% by the year 2020. And thereafter, we want to continue on that trajectory so that we can ultimately reach 10% growth rate in succeeding years. A panel of discussions is set, and the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, is part of it. The public sector must disclose to the private sector what they are doing to tackle the challenges of doing business with ease. The Vice President opens up discussions, stating that keys to realizing the ERGP include the power sector growth, port and customs reform, and also education reforms. But I don't, I don't really say something about the power sector, which is quite important now because uh, Tony and Co are all involved in the power sector. Which, uh, and for me, I think the most important thing is really in, ensuring that that sector is opened up for the private for private sector investment in the way that it ought to be. Unfortunately, when the first privatization took place, some of what happened was that okay, I mean, most of the uh, private sector companies that took over are very highly leveraged. And there's very little investment going into especially distribution at this point. What we found is that we're now, we're going to about 7,000, over 7,000 megawatts in capacity, yeah. right? Yeah. But distribution has proved to be a problem. No metering. The discos were meant to meter. They were meant to go out there and ensure they metered and collect. But that has proved impossible because obviously they don't have the, they don't have the resources to invest. So we've had to take, undertake a number of initiatives. One of them is the eligible customer directive, which was just issued in October. Now that eligible customer directive allows a willing buyer, willing seller option. So in some senses it breaks uh, the, the complete monopoly of discourse in being able to uh, supply electricity. The other is with respect to metering. We now have an independent uh, metering process which is also one of the new directives of NERC, which also allows individuals who are not necessarily discos to invest in metering and to actually meet up. Large-scale investors insist that while government's action is yielding food, investment in Nigeria's abundant human capital must be incentivized for businesses. On the whole subject of localization, I'd say one thing is very, very important, and that is that the, the government outlined very specific objectives and requirements and then hold us and other companies that are active in, in the country accountable for that. Uh, you know, we, we do business in 180 countries around the world and the ones that have clear expectations and, and align, allow businesses to align themselves accordingly get more investment. 
and it's a, it's a simple fact. Uh, we understand the role that we have to play in developing the economy. We accept that. What we want is a clear agenda from the government, which, which I think we're, we have, and then an expectation that everyone will be held to the same set of rules. And when we get that, we're like any other investor. If we can see the long term and it looks positive, we'll invest more. Localization is synonymous with the growth of SMEs. SMEs, to a large extent, are the lifeblood of every economy. And for us to grow our economy, we must emphasize this sector more significantly. And talking about SMEs starts from our youth. We have a lot of people who are enterprising, creative, across all sectors who are prepared to work if the opportunities present themselves. And so localization should seek to integrate everyone, should seek to create jobs, should seek to make sure that the hope and faith that I was talked about before uh, is restored. We need to see growth that is not on paper, but growth that is actually fair for our people. And this comes when our SMEs are integrated into our development agenda. We can't make more progress as a country if we don't prioritize our youth. If we don't, I keep coming back to this because it's so critical. We're a country vastly endowed with natural resources, and most importantly, in terms of population, and this population, the demographic, could be very positive.